All right, today on the bench, we have a misbehaving HP 3478, uh, what is it, five and a half digits uh, multimeter? That's what you call it? Yeah, five and a half. Sure. Uh, so the, those are great instruments in terms of precision. The, I, I, I don't like their display with your LCDs. I really don't either. It's just hard to read. All right, so I, I prefer the Vix 3455, right? That, that has the LEDs. Or afterwards, they backtracked. I think they put VFDs. In it. Right. Yeah, VFDs are very good. But it's still an absolutely excellent instrument. This one, uh, I think I got it for free. It just misbehaves. If uh, if you put no voltage on it, it says 0.62. Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you know that I have a soft spot for classic Hewlett Packard instruments. And I am obviously not the only one, as the engineering and build quality of these vintage instruments puts modern Chinesium or even Keysight ones to utter shame. The HP 3478A digital multimeter is a favorite of many an amateur test bench, and I already have a working one sitting front and center on my own bench. Its precision allowed us to pinpoint on which side of a coil a short had happened in our Apollo guidance computer, guiding us to one of the craziest repairs of the AGC restoration saga. Needless to say, it is a sought after instrument, however, one that you can still get for reasonably cheap. And if it's bad, for next to nothing. This one cost very exactly nothing when I picked it up during my great Los Angeles HP equipment haul of 2019. And if you put some voltage in it, which is one volt, well, actually it reads one volt, but I don't think it follows it. If I put four volts, it says it's two volts and it creeps up. This is so weird. So might be repairable, might not be repairable because if it's in one, or, so this is implemented with uh, hybrids, right? Uh, well, they have some custom chips. Right, there. custom chips. And if one of those is dead, then the whole thing is dead. So we'll find out. The HP 3478A first appears in the 1983 catalog. Despite its 5.5 digit capability and 100 nanovolt resolution, it is referred to as a low cost instrument. And indeed, it could be yours for a mere $1300, which would be about $4000 today. But in the HP world, it was low cost in comparison to other ones in the catalog, like the HP 3455A with its beautiful LEDs that I just showed. The 3455 had 6.5 digits, one more than our lowly 3478, and would set you back $4,500 or a whopping $14,000 in today's money. So the HP 3478 was somewhat of a bargain then, and is sure a real bargain now. But wait, there was an even more affordable version, also new in 1983, its little brother, the HP 3468A, has the same number of digits, albeit with only one microvolt max sensitivity. It also had a cheaper looking plastic case and lacked the HPIB port. But it could be had for only $695. That would be a mere 2,152 Yankee pesos in today's money. Now we are really scraping bottom. That said, the 3468 has some interesting unique features. It was designed for field use, so you could run it on batteries if so optioned. And although it had no HPIB, it was the first instrument to support the new HPIL interface. This was done so you could hook it up to the HP 41C calculator. And then you'd surely be the coolest engineer in the field. Imagine that you are in a remote field location, like for example Sally Ride in the Space Shuttle STS-7. And look, you just happen to have three HP 41Cs floating around next to you. How convenient! You could hook them up to your 3468A and do high precision voltage measurements in space. All that to say that if you have an HP 41C calculator in your collection, you might want to go for the 3468 instead of the 3478. 
Anyhow, as we will soon see, the most interesting part of our DVM is its proprietary A2D converter. It was a very innovative technique that HP called Multislope 2 and is covered in this HP patent. It is much easier to understand if we follow the evolution of the previous instruments, the Nixie HP 3450 and the LED HP 3455. Let's start with the HP 3450, which arguably has the best display. It was the first HP instrument to use a technique known as dual ramp integration. It is a simple and elegant circuit, shown on the left here. It consists of an electronic switch, an integrator made of a capacitor and an op amp, and a zero comparator. The figure to the right explains how it works. The electronic switch starts in the upper position and the input voltage charges the capacitor through the resistor R. Since an op amp input is always near zero volts, the so-called virtual ground, the resistor sees a constant voltage drop and charges the capacitor at a constant current. This results in a nice, perfectly straight linear voltage ramp at the output of the integrator. This is called the run-up. After a fixed amount of time t, the switch is moved to the down position. A negative reference voltage is now applied to resistance R. This results in an equally nice, perfectly linear ramp down known as the rundown. Unlike the run-up, which duration is fixed, the rundown is allowed to continue until the zero comparator triggers, signaling that the capacitor is discharged. This time is called little t. The clever property of this run-up rundown scheme is that the unknown voltage can be inferred by the ratio of little t over big t times the reference voltage. The result is totally independent of the value of capacitor C, resistance R, and even the long-term stability of the clock used to count big t and little t. Very simple, very clever. You can see the picture of the dual slope scheme referred to as prior art in the patent. This scheme continues to evolve with the next generation instrument, the HP3455, now with LEDs, both the run-up, labeled RU, and the run-down, labeled RD, are more complicated. On the run-up, instead of going straight up, you can see that it has periods where it is ramping down. The capacitor is now pre-discharged for a fixed amount of time by simply adding a reference current opposite to and greater than the input current. When it is sufficiently discharged, the process starts again. This greatly extends dynamic range without having to let the capacitor reach impractically high voltages. The rundown has now two slopes to it, a steep one and a shallow one, which is why the scheme is called multi-slope. This improves the timing precision of the rundown without having it take longer. The more complicated sequencing and the additional math were handled by HP's new 8-bit nanoprocessor. The HP3455 was one of the early instruments to directly benefit from HP's new microcontroller, which you can learn all about in one of Ken's blog articles. Which brings us to the third generation, our HP 3478, now with an LCD display and mushy buttons, which I definitely do not count as an improvement, if you ignore cost, of course. Welcome to modern electronics. The run-up and the run-down are now way more complicated, and there is even a pre-run-down period added, shown as PRD. It is still the same principle though, which they call multi-slope 2. One disadvantage of the previous scheme is that you needed three precision comparators to trigger your RAM changes and had to keep their offsets in check. The beauty of multi-slope 2 is that it works with a single zero comparator. Let's look at the run-up first. It starts normally with the input voltage creating the first slope up. Then an opposing current, always larger than the input current, is added in, just as in the previous case. That causes the ramp to go down. This lasts for a fixed amount of time, called a ramp unit. Then it is withdrawn for a short amount of time. 
That's when you see the slight tooth going up caused by our input current taking over again. At this point, a decision is made. If the voltage is still above zero, the down ramp current is applied again and this is repeated until the capacitor finally discharges below zero. At that point, the circuit reverses the sign of the added ramp current. Now it hastens the charge rather than opposing it. That's why you see the big fast ramp, which is the sum of the input current and the positive ramp reference current. This lasts just one ramp unit. Then the reference current is reversed again and we see down ramps until zero is crossed again. This is done for a fixed number of ramps, which is quite large, over 300 ramp units. When the run-up is finished, there is one last up ramp called the pre-run-down or PRD. This one is done to ensure that the voltage is boosted above zero if it ever ended down below zero. They also do it if the voltage ended up above zero, which is the case shown in the figure. That's because they want to keep the number of current switching cycles deterministic, so they can later correct the slight but unavoidable offset caused by switching. After this wild ride, we have arrived at rundown. It is shown in detail in figure 9 of the patent. The input voltage is finally disconnected, so when no extra reference current is applied, the voltage stays flat, which is what you see in the first period. Then a first ramp down reference current is applied, again for a number of periods, after which the voltage is checked for polarity. In our figure, this happens after the first dollop of the end ramp. Once the polarity change is detected, an opposite ramp with a 10x lesser slope is applied. This time, a polarity change is detected after the fifth ramp unit. Then again, we ramp in the opposite direction with 100 times less current. This one takes six periods. And finally, another ramp up is applied with a 1000 lesser slope. Now, all you need to do is add up the number of up ramps and down ramps weighted by their relative currents. After some math, you can back calculate the input voltage. The first three digits come from the ramp up and the three last digits come from the ramp down. Part of the added complexity is shifted to the digital controller, which is now a more powerful Intel 8039 microcontroller. You also need a whole bunch of precision resistors and switches to furnish the many reference currents. That's what our ADC hybrid chip does. HP fabricated precision laser trimmed resistors on ceramic and put the CMOS latches and diode switches right next to it. I admit that's all pretty impressive, Although having problems with the ADC and its hybrid is not a welcome thing, I was secretly hoping that something was wrong with it so we could look at it in action. So let's go back to our repair. And then if you put some voltage in it, you put 4 volts, it says it's 2 volts, and it creeps up. This is so weird. So might be repairable, might not be repairable because if it's in one node. So this is implemented with uh, hybrids, right? Uh, well, they have some custom chips. Right, custom chips. So there's two versions. There's the higher end, which is the 3478A. So this one is the, the fancier one with the metal case. And there's a 3468 in a plastic case and doesn't have HDID. And it has a worse voltage reference. The fancy one has the ovenized uh, buried Zener reference. The low cost one is not. I forgot, yes, that's true. And they also have the infamous battery in there. The calibration data is battery back. And if the battery goes, you lose your calibration. The infamous battery. There we go. <laughs> Look at that little plastic lever going all the way over from the front panel. And that's one of their hybrids underneath, I suppose. Um, I don't know what that is. It looks like it's a socket of some kind. I haven't seen anything like that before. Uh, all right. Nothing seems amiss. Okay, well, let's futz around, see what could be wrong with it. All right. 
So first things first, check if our battery is still alive. And we could see it had been changed before, so yeah, it's three volts, so it's still still alive. So hopefully it has calibration and I think since it, the digital part seems to work, it's, it has to be within those two pages, right? So that's the input. Huh, spark gap protection, really. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole bunch of relays and... What are these things where the gate is not connected to those anything? Those are MOSFETs and they're just not showing uh, what's driving the gate. Oh. So presumably it's some shift register or some digitally controlled... Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so those are just analog. No higher quality analog switches. Exactly. Well, they put three. Oh, this is to select the gain. That's the gain of the non inverting amplifier. Right. Amplifier. And mm -hmm. well, what is that thing? Over voltage protection. Okay. That's for the uh, Ohm's current source. So that, that current gets generated over here and then driven out through that protection circuit to be the test current that goes into the resistor okay. that you're measuring. Right? So we could figure out if our voltage appears from here, it appears over here or over there. JM101, we should, we should figure out what, what, where that one is. If our A2D is getting something. Mm -hmm. JM101, okay. So Eric, you saw the voltage reference? Yeah, it's right here. This is a linear tech part. I have the wire right in front of it. Let me move it. Yep. It's probably uh, like a TO99 case and mm -hmm. plastic insulating case because it's got a heater built in and the plastic is to keep the heat in. Huh, it's a miniature oven. It's to insulate it, yes. Pretty cool. Alright, so GM oh oh GM101 uh -huh. right here. Have it. Right next to the source. So uh, we wanted to check the power supply first and it turns out it's super easy to tell you those jumpers here. Five minus fifteen and plus five over there. Five point Oh, something. This is minus 15. Plus 15. 14.97, also very close. Okay, that's not the problem. So then the procedure tells you to feed it 3 volts, uh, manual range. That looks right. And you want to disable auto zero. Shift auto zero. So now they want us to see uh, a GM 101. And we have 6 volts. And moving and going down, so the signal is not making it. So that tells us that the A to D converter is probably okay, and the problem is between the ADC and the front panel somewhere. You know what? How we could test easily? We remove that jumper, we feed it 10 volts, and if it does us three, then we probably we do have, that too. Uh, have that good. And this instrument continues to be excellently done. Um, they even write, they have a a front and a back silk screen, so GM101 is right here, so you want to... If you try to unsorter that stuff, I'll try to lift it up from here. And now, there you go. Yeah, we have it. So Eric is setting the machine. Manual range. So I'm going to do this one. And yeah. Straight to the DC. So here we go, we put... 10 volts at the input of the ADC. So that's my 10 volt reference back there. Which now I jumpered the whole front section and put it straight into the ADC and it should read 3, which is a correct reading. It's supposed to divide by 3. Okay, well at least the ADC is working, so that's yeah, great. Yeah. So we have a problem in the input section. I let Eric decipher the scriptures. What do the scriptures say? There are three things that we are testing when we follow this floating reading on all ranges troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. Number one is the wiring between the terminals and the front rear selection switch. Okay. Number two is the input hybrid. And number three is the buffer amplifier. And this is another one that uh, you mentioned could be wrong, is that there are inputs on the front, but there are also banana jacks on the back. And there's this big switch on the top that switches between front and back. So it could be that switch is bad. And this is the common connection and it's open. So Aww. nothing. <laughs> 
I would be silly if that was the case. It's open. Yeah, there's no connection. Okay. Hmm. Well, we take that switch apart and we fix it. Okay, finally we got the switch cleanly out, which was a bit of a battle since they wrap everything around the pins. Okay, we finally managed to get the plunger out of the thing. There is a, a little tab that you have to lift here, which is pretty hard. And it's all coming apart and hopefully we won't lose the little contacts. Yeah, there are springs behind them, so they should be super good quality. Why is it not making contact? But I don't see much corrosion at all. That's a plunger with little springs. It looks all fine and dandy to me. Why is it not making contact? Give it a good clean. The offset tab. And cute up in there or something. Ah, I lost one contact. Okay, great. I have to reassemble contact. Tweezers! And easy. This is the exact size of the cotton swab. Whee! Oh, that's, that's just sheer luck. Oh, except now it's catching on the on the on the thing that was annoying me in the first place and preventing me to get the, um, the plunger out. I, I'm trapped. Okay, so I have to untrap myself. Oh, what a pain the thing is. That's when the electronics went cheap. There, assemble once, never disassemble again. All right, that should do it. Okay. Testing, testing. Okay. Okay. Did we repair the one that was broken? That was this one. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I put the clicky back together and we resolder it and we're done. All right, so that's my handy dandy work. So hopefully that works. Okay, put it at, at zero. Tunk, self test, HVIB, zero something. Do one volt. One volt, 0.033. Two volts, three volts, it's, it's all there was to it. Four volts, it switched automatically to the next. Seven volt, eight volt, nine volt, 19 volts. <laughs> so go, go one up on the, on the station. There you go, you get that 10 volts. Okay, it works. Um, should we try resistance? Let's give it a shot. That's the mother of all decayed resistor boxes. Okay, my friend, what did it say? 0 0.1358 ohms. And okay, that's all point. zero. Works. 10 yeah, kilos. 10k. All right. Want to do a four wire? Yeah, we should just, just be able to plug them right there. So the four wire measurement it looks stupid because you wire to the same thing. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, we gained another 0.0 uh, decimal. Let's see if the zero's out. Zero's out, okay. So it might just be the decade box. Uh, that's, that's okay, we'll be happy with two zeros. It's not bad. Uh, with with uh, one milliohm. And then, you do that, that's the box. 
Okay, so the box is not bad at all. The box is 30 milliohms. No, 3 milliohms. Uh, redo it at zero and wait a second. Yeah, the box is 21 milliohms. So that's the big difference in doing four wires. So what happens is that the also it looks silly like the four wires are going to the same place. Um, the testing current goes through a pair of wire and the measuring goes through another pair of wire. So you don't get the error caused by the testing current causing um, a, a, a voltage over the wiring. All right, so that's, wow, that's pretty good. 10 kilo ohms. All right, repaired. Um, so one quick thing I want, I want to do is replace the uh, lithium battery while we're at it. So although this one still checks good, we, we don't know when it's going to expire. Yeah, there are two problems with replacing this thing. The first one is that if you just take it off, you will lose your calibrations. So two ways around it, you either um, put an extra battery while you remove that one, uh, or the easier method is you just turn it on and uh, once the while the instrument is powered, uh, there is power to the CMOS, so you're safe to remove it. The second problem is that if you use your soldering iron and you touch the plus, the soldering iron is grounded, it will short the battery. Uh, so several ways around that, you can just use your soldering iron, but just before you touch the positive, you unplug it. Or you do like me, you use this butane part thing, which is very convenient. I like it very much. There we go. No electricity needed for this one. It's pretty powerful. So I'll just do this and I'll, I'll be done in hopefully a few minutes uh, rather than do the more complicated methods. This is welded. So we first need to do a snipper ruski. Snippy over there. And snippy over here. It's just, it's just looking at this thing. It is actually an HP part. It is 1420-0278. It is either the original one or refurbished at HP. And so. Okay, it's written minus, plus, it's written plus. So be careful not to short anything because of course the device is under power, here we go. Three volts. And of course the question is, is it still calibrated? One volt, we get one, two volts, we get two, three volts, we get three, four volts, we get four, five volts, we get five, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is not the, uh, it, it doesn't have the, the, the force decimal to it. It only has two, actually. It's pretty good that it gets two, three. Uh, but that will do. It hasn't lost its calibration. It's fine. So it's too bad this instrument was not broken enough so we could look at the uh, incredible uh, A2D converter. With uh, I wanted to look at it anyhow. So I hooked myself up to the integrator capacitor. That's the integrator op amp and that's the integrator capacitor. And I am at the output of the integrator. Mike, we're marveling at the uh, HP 3478 and it's homemade D2A. They go completely bonkers. <laughs> So we'll take the auto zero out because it's it's a bit annoying. Okay, auto zero off. And now you have the actual okay. measurement. But they have a pattern that explains it. And what's happening right here at the end where it's like tiny zigzag? That's the multi-slope. So the run-up, if it didn't have a crazy scheme to it, it would just go up mm -hmm. all the time. And then you would run it down. But instead of running it up in one fell swoop, they run it up and then they discharge it mm -hmm. while still having the current that runs it up. And if I hardly vary the voltage, you can see how, oh, wow. how yeah. sensitive that is. And let me put it maybe 2.9 volts. Yeah, that's a good one. That's interesting. 
So you can see they reverse the polarity um, of the charging as soon as it crosses zero. So three until it crosses zero, mm -hmm. then back up. Four, it, it took a little longer time. Another four, and now another, another three. Hmm. And actually on the way up, they help it out to make sure it crosses zero. So you have always a current pushing up or a current pushing down, except in small switching times. So they help it up and help, help it down and help, help it down and help, help it down and help, help it up. And the reason they do that is that they have a constant amount of switching. So if there's a little timing error in the switching, it, they, they can calibrate it out. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, just, it's just crazy. That's the fixed part run up time. Mm -hmm. And here's the rundown. I'll just switch to it if I can. So here's the rundown, and the rundown is a triple slope. It's completely disconnected from the input. They add a little bit, and that's so they are sure that it's going to cross the zero. And now they do one rundown, then they do a second run up, but at the lower slope. And then there's a third slope yeah, that's <coughs> over here yeah, to the right. Here. <laughs> and the third one is the part that's timed. Gotcha. And, and they, they get five and a half digits out of that. <laughs> it's, just, it, it's, it's Apollo complexity. Then they, they have one instrument that you looked at that does seven or eight decimals. Yeah, they've got all sorts of issues that you know, the resistors will heat up if you have current going through them, so you have to deal with that. And so it's just all these things you wouldn't think of that turn into problems at, at that resolution. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. So they. Anyhow, somebody thought about it really, really long. <laughs> and of course, no HP3478 video would be complete without mentioning the heroic efforts for adding backlighting solutions to the LCD of this and the HP3457. It seems simple, but it is actually quite difficult. It's a custom alphanumeric LCD, so there are no commercial replacements. There is zero space back there too. You must take out the back reflector, add a polarizer, change the thickness of the zebra stripes, modify the connectors to regain some lost space. Ian Johnston has a great video on the process. A simpler mechanical solution is to add an electroluminescent backlight panel, but then your instrument gets flooded by AC noise from the high voltage supply. Some amazing good hacking went into reverse engineering the communication protocol, then using a microprocessor to drive custom made LEDs, or even better, an OLED panel on a multi level PCB. I am in awe. But until a clean OLED kit becomes available, I'm going to enjoy this classic little instrument that pulls way above its weight, just as Mother HP made it. Yeah, and it has this nice sticker that says metric. Americans, stay away, this is Matrix, not for you to repair. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to Canadians. <laughs>